are very excited um, to welcome our guests this evening. So before we get started, I'd just like to remind everybody um, that we have muted everyone. So just helps eliminate a lot of the background noise. Um, so if you have any questions, um, please put them in the chat box. We um, will be, um, after Danny and Rafi do their presentation, um, I will be moderating the Q&A at the end um, of their presentation. So go ahead and put all of your questions in the chat box and we'll take care of those um, in the, probably the last 20 minutes. So um, to get us started, I would like to welcome our committee member, Andy Richards, who will be doing an introduction. Good evening, Andy. Good evening, Stephanie. My name is Andy Richards, and I am so happy to introduce my favorite book of the book festival, Red Sea Spies, the true story of Mossad's fake diving resort. Red Sea Spies tells the true story of a luxury diving resort in a remote area off the Sudanese coast in the 1980s, where all the guests are real and all the staff are Mossad. We are joined tonight by the author, Rafi Berg, and the former Mossad commander, Danny Lamour. Rafi Berg began his journalism career in television news in London in the 1990s. In 2001, he joined the BBC News website and he is currently the Middle East editor. He graduated from the London School of Economics with a degree in modern and medieval history and studied Jewish and Israel studies at the Hebrew University of, of Jerusalem. He currently lives in London with his family. Former Mossad commander Danny Lamour was born and raised in Montevideo, Uruguay. At the age of 16, he traveled alone to Israel with youth Aliyah. He studied yeshiva before joining the IDF as an officer with the paratroopers. In 1968, he joined Mossad and spent 25 years in the field and at Mossad headquarters. Now retired, he is involved in the mapping of emerging Jewish communities around the world for the diaspora ministry. To this day, virtually all of Limor's assignments remain with Mossad remain classified. Thank you to the Jewish Federation of Greater Toledo and Foundation for supporting this presentation. Well, thank you very much. Uh, lovely to be here, my first visit to Ohio, and uh, welcome you all to my home in London. Danny is joining us from Israel, so we've got uh, at least three different time zones uh, going on simultaneously. Uh, the premise of the story was explained um, rather succinctly and properly in the introduction there. And it's an incredible series of events that we're talking about in my 25 plus years as a journalist specializing in, in the Middle East. I haven't come across a story quite like it. Uh, there's nothing I can quite compare it to. It works on many, many levels, not least of which is it's a story about human endurance and fortitude and courage. And one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about sharing this story uh, with communities is because it's very important. It's an important part of all our shared Jewish heritage. And one of the things which it opened my eyes and my heart to was the existence and the specialness of the Ethiopian Jews. When I started out on this journey of discovery a few years ago, I knew next to nothing about Ethiopian Judaism. I had kind of a vague awareness that there was such a thing as Ethiopian Jews. Didn't know much about them. If you would have asked me, I would have answered you. I think they're a tribe. They may or may not be Jewish. I'm not sure. But really doing this project for me was an absolute um, epiphany. Because what I discovered very early on, is that the people at the heart of this spectacular story are a community who, as a Jewish person, I feel immensely proud to, uh, 
to accept and be part of as, as, as the fraternity of, uh, of the Jewish diaspora. A few years ago, I stumbled across uh, information that uh, a movie was being planned in the works about a secret operation, which I knew very little about. There were fragments of information out there. But it was to do with a Mossad mission which used a fake resort as, uh, as, as a cover for smuggling Ethiopian Jews out of Sudan. So I started to investigate in my job at the BBC. And what I found as I kind of pieced it together absolutely blew me away. So I wrote a, an article for online on the internet and it absolutely captured people's imagination. It did incredibly well, had millions of, uh, of page views as they, as they call it, to use the terminology. And then the opportunity arose for me to write a book. I was approached by a firm of publishers, which for a journalist is something extraordinary. I've always dreamt of writing a book, never really had the, the time. I mean, there's been subject, you know, lots of subject matters which I'd like to have written about, but never actually happened that way. But here I was presented with this golden opportunity, which was fantastic, but it was just the beginning of what was going to be a very hard part, which was getting the agreement of those who participated in the operation to collaborate with me on writing a book. And cutting this part of the story short, uh, I was informed by one of the participants in the operation that I needed to get the cooperation of the commander of the operation, because without his, uh, his input and partnership, then I could forget about writing a book about it. So I got in touch with the individual who was Danny. We didn't know each other in the, the, at that point at all. Uh, he didn't want to speak to me over the phone, but invited me to meet him face to face uh, at Charles de Gaulle Airport in Paris. So there I was, uh, in Paris, waiting for Danny to turn up, and uh, we met late in the evening. And uh, you know, he spared me close to an hour, uh, asked me about my intentions, and he was you know, wanting to check me out quite clearly. Uh, and at the end of our conversation, he said, "Leave it with me. I think about it. Uh, it just so happens that I was work. I worked on the movie, and I'm interested in documenting the real." story. Now, I mentioned the movie. This is a Netflix movie, which actually came out earlier this year called The Red Sea Diving Resort, which you may know about or may have watched. This is a poster from the movie. Uh, Chris Evans, the chap with the beard, uh, portrays the commander of the operation in the film. He depicts Danny. Danny worked on the movie and as a, in a consultative capacity. And he came back to me after our meeting and said it's something he wanted to go ahead with. He wanted to write the book because he wanted to put on record as far as possible uh, the actual events which happened as close to the truth uh, as, as, as could be managed. So perhaps at this point, I'll uh, bring Danny into the conversation. And, uh, and Danny, well, can, can I ask you, uh, what did the movie or how did the movie and the book uh, represent what actually happened in real life? Well, uh, I could uh, make it very short and say that uh, because of the movie, I decided to cooperate with you and uh, in the writing of the book because <clears throat> it's not a uh, criticism that I'm making on the movie uh, because to be honest, the, the scriptwriter and director of the film, Gidon Raff, who is an Israeli, and I, we're friends, 
Uh, he told me in advance um, that this, this film was going to be inspired, in fact, not based upon, which means that uh, he took a lot of, um, a lot of uh, liberty, a lot of uh, independence in, in, uh, in uh, bringing facts. So there are some facts in the movie. There are some things that uh, uh, remind uh, that, you know, uh, represent a bit of what happened, but uh, most of it is, um, is a Hollywood imagination. And uh, as he told me while he was making the movie, that this was going to be, uh, uh, you know, it was going to try and uh, interest the American public. So, for example, introduced as a big uh, fa factor in the story, the CIA. Actually, in reality, the, the CIA was, uh, we never did anything with the CIA. Especially, we didn't need them to evacuate us from anywhere. And um, it's very nice, CIA is a very uh, good uh, organization I have nothing to, nothing bad to say about, but they were not part of this operation. And I could not leave uh, this, the, because the movie uh, actually attract, attracted a lot of people. I, I could not uh, accept the fact that the people would think that this is what happened. And so uh, it was, uh, made, made it easier for me to, to want to uh, cooperate with you because the thing that I, you convinced me, you're a very, very convincing guy, and you convinced me that uh, you were going to be very accurate and very thorough, and this is what you did. Uh, actually, I remember telling you, you don't have to believe me, you know, you have to cross-check everything. And you actually dug up uh, lots of, source, lots of uh, um, sources of information from every kind, from the Ethiopian Jews and the army people and the other people in Sudan even. So um, that's it. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll mention one, of the, one or two of the things which I, I did find out uh, shortly. But uh, I think it's important to, uh, to put into context and explain uh, who the Ethiopian Jews are, because after all, this is the story is about them. The operation was to bring the Ethiopian Jews to Israel. Now, Danny can talk, obviously, about the operational side of things, but uh, when we talk about the Ethiopian Jews, uh, it's, it's worth addressing who, who and what we mean by them. Where do they come from? Are they proper Jews, and, and why did it take a secret operation to bring them to Israel? Well, there's, a, the, there's a, an abundance of theories about where Ethiopian Jews uh, come from originally. There's, uh, there's outlandish um, fables, like uh, the most exotic one perhaps is that they descend from a relationship between the Queen of Sheba and King Solomon. That's, uh, that's long been discounted. Other suggestions are that they are Jews who came from Southern Arabia or from, uh, from Egypt. But it's been known down the centuries, if not for millennia, among the Jewish sages that the Jews of Ethiopia actually descend from the tribe of Dan, one of the 12 tribes of Israel, sons of, of, uh, of Jacob, that they arrived in Ethiopia after either uh, leaving the land of Israel after the, um, after the reign of King Solomon, or that they're one of the 10 lost tribes uh, captured by the Assyrian Empire when the Assyrians invaded the, the Northern Kingdom in the, in the 8th century. But for many centuries, Ethiopian Jews were isolated in their homes in Northern Ethiopia. Their homes were in the highlands, in the mountainous area. 
And they didn't know that there was any such thing as a non-black Jew. They didn't know that there was any white Jews. They thought they were the last representatives of Judaism on planet Earth. And that form of Judaism, by the way, is has differences and similarities to, to the Judaism that we're used to. They split off from, let's call it mainstream Judaism. It's, it's not the most correct word to use, but it you know, it's kind of gives us an idea of what we're talking about. They split off from mainstream Judaism before the advent of, uh, of, of the Talmud. So Ethiopian Jews knew only of the written law and they were absolutely scrupulous in their adherence to uh, to biblical judaism the, i don't have time to go into it it's definitely worth uh, exploring their observance of shabbat for instance was absolutely was you know faultless uh, the kashrut their um they pray that the, the, in Jerusalem, the, the concept of Jerusalem to Ethiopian Jews, this is what sustained them in their isolation and, uh, and the war, and wars that they fought down the centuries. There was a, an ancestral longing to return to the land of the forefathers. And every generation lived in hope that theirs would be the one to return to what they called the land of Jerusalem as prophesied by, by Isaiah. Isaiah spoke of the return of the Jews from the land of Cush, Cush, representing more or less Ethiopia. There was a, uh, the first Jewish outsider to make contact with Ethiopian Jews. It wasn't until as recently as uh, the late 19th century, a Jewish scholar uh, called uh, Joseph Halevi. He writes how they the Ethiopian villagers were disinterested in him because they didn't believe he could be Jewish. He was a white man until he mentioned Jerusalem. And he, he writes in beautiful language how all at once the atmosphere changed and he was bombarded with questions about what's Jerusalem like? Have you seen it with your own eyes? And when he explained that Jerusalem had been conquered by the Roman Empire, the Jews were absolutely crestfallen. They were despondent because they didn't know. Uh, come 1948, the creation of the State of Israel, and a little after that, the Law of Return, which was uh, in, introduced. Every Jew on earth was allowed to settle in Israel automatically. An automatic right was extended to them, apart from the Jews of Ethiopia, because the Israeli Interior Ministry did not recognize them as proper Jews. This is regardless of the fact that great Jewish sages from the Middle Ages, the chief rabbis of Egypt, categorically declared that Ethiopian Jews were halachically Jewish. And this is something which had been accepted down the centuries. And then it took until the advent of Prime Minister Menachem Begin in 1977 for the order to be given from him to the head, the then head of the Mossad, to bring me the Jews of Ethiopia, is, is what he is said to have said. And perhaps I can bring Danny into the story because this is a job which fell on Danny's shoulders. So how did, how did the operational side of this begin? Well, it began like uh, it followed with a meeting between a white Jew coming from Israel and a black Jew coming from Ethiopia. And we met in Sudan, in Khartoum. Um, his name was Ferdi Aklu. God rest his peace. He's, he's, uh, he's, uh, he's, uh, he's gone. And um, he was, um, he was a leader in the community in Ethiopia. He was a young leader, he was a teacher. And he um, had to escape uh, his village because he was going to be 
arrested and interrogated by the Ethiopian Secret Service. And they are not very kind. So he, um, he, he joined a massive movement of refugees that were leaving Ethiopia and Eritrea and all the, all that area going to Sudan to camps that were built by the United Nations High Commission of Refugees. And so he arrived to Khartoum and he let know through um, a, a Jewish um, agency in Switzerland that he was there waiting in Khartoum for a ticket to be sent to him so he could come to, to Israel. Well, he didn't mention Israel, of course. He said, home, I want to go come home. And um, yeah, this telegram was brought to me by someone I trusted and who knew personally Faraday from Ethiopia. He had met him and he was uh, very impressed by him. So he told me all about him. And so a decision was made at uh, headquarters that instead of sending me a ticket, uh, they will send me to, to look for him and, uh, and, and check with him what could be done. Because if he managed to reach uh, Khartoum, maybe others could as well. I have to understand the, the, the geopolitical situation at uh, the, the time. It was not easy. We have not... Uh, much time, so in a few words, Ethiopia at the time was in a turmoil because there had been a, a military coup that had finished with the Solomonic dynasty of kings and the, the army uh, took over and they brought the Soviets and the Cubans and the West uh, East Germans as well. And uh, many people were leaving because the situation was chaotic you know, there was, each, uh, there was a lot of shooting in the area between guerrilla movements and bandits and uh, deserters and liberation movements, Eritrea, Tigray. By the way, they, right now, again, they're fighting. The Tigrayans are, are fighting for independence and they will probably get it. So this the whole thing um, brought about a, a large movement of people, some Jews, but not the Jews were waiting for the world. They were waiting already 2,500 years to return to Zion. Zion is Jerusalem. But they had to have someone to tell them that this is the moment. And they were waiting. They were not suffering specifically because they were Jewish. They were waiting for the moment to come. Now, when I met Faraday, this meeting, it was not easy to find him because, of course, he was not a, he didn't live in, in, inside the, the, the P.O. box, it's very small. Uh, but uh, I found him eventually. And the first thing that struck me about him was his courage. His, he was fearless. I mean, he, when I told him, look, I came here because of you and because I understand that if we cooperate, we can bring a lot of Jews from Ethiopia to Sudan, and then from Sudan, we'll find a way to evacuate them. And uh, Ferde was, uh, he had his own problems because he left his wife and a small baby, re recent born first son. He could not take them with him in his journey to Sudan. He was worried about them. So I told him that I will take care of that. I didn't tell him that I was an Israeli because you don't do that in an Arab country. But, uh, and I didn't know him, you know, you have to develop some trust. By the way, he, he didn't trust me also because I'm, I was too white, you know? And um, uh, yeah, and they, you know, it's a question of, uh, the, but at the end, we were a very different man, although approximately the same age, but very different backgrounds, but the color was not the problem. And actually, after we started sleeping in the bush and eating uh, from the nature and, and drinking from uh, rivers, uh, we became very close. You know, first we were friends and then we became brothers. And maybe this operation uh, was called among other reasons, Operation Brothers, 
because this relationship that developed, developed be, between us, by the way, that's one thing that you can see somehow in the Netflix movie. And later on, when we started meeting Jews, and then sent, he sent messages to Ethiopia, that was the sign for them to begin their journey, marching through a very dangerous areas to reach the Sudanese border and cross it illegally, and then arrive to the camps, which were not what you would call a camp. It was some like huts in the middle of the desert. And when I started meeting the, the people that came, I saw, you know, the, I, 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 for me, is it was recognizing my own people, you know. You don't, you, you are colorblind. This is nothing to do with how they look or how they behave. What is their, you know, I told this story and I, I tell it in a few words. I had, uh, after some time, there were hundreds of Jews in the camps and we were having problems controlling the flow and, and getting them out on time and so on. And, uh, and Ethiopian non-Jews recognized the former neighbors by their customs, by their traditions. So they recognized them as Jews. And some of them went to the Sudanese, um, you know, secret service to tell them this is Jewish people, you know, and they are coming and then they are disappearing in the middle of the night. So we want to know what's going on. And they recognize them among other things because in, in, a Jew, in, in front of a Jewish home, on, in Shabbat, there is no fire. All the other houses, they have the fire burning, but the Jews, they, uh, they only, uh, in Shabbat, there's no fire. There's no cooking, no fire. So I asked Faraday to arrange a meeting with uh, those uh, spiritual leaders that are, like the Kasim, which are more than spiritual leaders. They are, you know, religious leaders. And I wanted to talk to them about this thing because for me it was, it became problematic as, you know, I was in charge of getting them out of the camps. But once they were recognized as Jews, the army would watch them especially and that make, made it very difficult. So I had a long meeting, I mean, the meeting was long, but I just say, said a few words uh, that further translated into Tigrinian and Amharic. And that I, I told them, look, I understand that you want to respect the Shabbat. And I also keep Shabbat, but we are in a specific situation that uh, creates a, a, a situation, creates the, the, the this kind of problem that the halacha says that in Shabbat you can you can you can uh, do everything in Shabbat to save lives, okay? But they didn't know this this halacha because this was from the oral law. So they discussed and they they, they talked about it because they they had some respect for me. They wanted to give me the the you know the that I, sh I should feel well. And so they really discussed it, but at the end, the, the, the oldest and the, the most uh, senior of those uh, case uh, told me, look, young man, uh, we understand what you're asking and we understand why you're asking, but we have been keeping Shabbat since antiquity and we have been in much harder situation than this one. You know, in, in my imagination, I could not think what could be worse than being in a, in a Sudanese uh, so-called refugee camp in the middle of the desert uh, as, as an Ethiopian Jew in a, in, a, in a Muslim Arab country. But that's what he said and said, don't worry, the, you know, God will, will keep us and everything will be okay. Just to close down this story, about five or six years later, I was in a wedding in Israel and talking to someone at a wedding that I was invited by some young uh, Ethiopian Jews. And then, and then someone calls me by my name and from behind, I turn around 
And I see a very impressive uh, case, all in white with the turban and so on, but I, I could not recognize them. But I saw him in the night and I, there were many, so I could not. But he, he said, you, you, you don't remember me, but you, re you will remember what I told you about five or six years ago in a camp in Sudan, that God will, be, uh, will keep us and we, it will be all right. So we're in a wedding in Israel, what can be bad? Yeah, so we, we, we developed a sort of um, evacuation system, bringing uh, uh, people from the camps to the capital Khartoum, hiding them in safe houses. It's 400 kilometers, about 300 miles or something, with the many uh, military checkpoints. So we only worked at night. We only traveled by night and we never stopped in those uh, checkpoints which was not always easy. And we kept them in those safe houses until we found a system to get them out to Europe. And that was done in, a, in a association of, with some of fr friendly services in Europe, European countries that accepted the, them as, as uh, if they were only passing by um, European airports and then going straight to Israel. And, um, but this was also very sensitive because I was impersonating, a, I was an anthropologist, but I was impersonating a United Nations uh, official and this was very thin as a cover. And uh, once I almost got caught, uh, got uh, actually the guy from the uh, from the Sudanese Ministry of Interior started suspecting me and we were arrested and we spent time in prison and uh, we were shot at. And, uh, but all, all along, I always had people, immigrants, Jewish immigrants from Ethiopia that just arrived after a very long and dangerous march where they, you know, there were losses people died and the women were raped and you know things horrible things happened and they still had the courage and the energy to do things for for us for the Mossad people that without it we could not carry on I mean there were all parts of the operation that were carried out by them an example we needed a, a group of people say 200 people we wanted to evacuate in, in a given night. We could not enter ourselves the camps. So I fixed a, a, a rendezvous with a, one of their leaders in a certain place, five, five miles from the camps. Their task was to organize them in silence so the neighbors will not feel anything because they would run to the, to the, to the Sudanese army and so on. Everything in silence and lead them through the field, through some, you know, riverbed or something, uh, hiding from the, from patrols, army patrols, police patrols, and so on, to get them to the meeting with us. And this was a crucial part of the operation. Without it, then nothing would happen. And then this is only one, one aspect of it. The whole thing was done together. Each, each one of us, knew his task. And after some problems, uh, you know, after they started shooting us on the way to Khartoum, we went uh, patrolling the Red Sea, looking for a place where we could, you know, I thought about a, a naval, a, a cooperation with the Navy, and then uh, looking for places to meet with the Navy SEALs. And so that's how I, you know, discovered the resort that became the main subject of the, of the book and the, or the film. In the book, there are many other things. And uh, yes, this resort that we discovered, you know, by chance, it was clear immediately to me that uh, this was going to be the perfect cover, that I could uh, uh, raise a bigger team and uh, therefore, uh, take much more people, uh, 
but the problem was that the distance doubled. So we had to hide. Uh, we could not do it in one night. It was, it was about 750 miles. You cannot do it in one night. And when you're driving with a lot of people and uh, you have to be careful because this is a very dangerous road. There are also checkpoints and there are large semi-trailers uh, coming towards you. Anyway, it's a lot of things. And um, we hid during the day in some place. And then the next night we um, rendezvoused with the, with the Navy SEALs on the beach. They took them to the ship. The ship took them back home. And to finish the, the, all, the all the ways that we did it, you know, I don't know if you want me to go into the, what happened one night in, in, in the beach, you describe it very well in the book. And it's even one of the scenes of the movie. Well, I think, I think we'll, we should definitely uh, talk about that in a moment because um, you know, you, you, you've introduced uh, the, the diving resort in, into the story. And this is really what's, um, what's captured people's imagination. Uh, extraordinary. It's, uh, certainly, I've, I've never heard of a, a ruse like it. Um, when I was uh, researching about the resort for the book, I uncovered some really interesting things that weren't known about before. One of which was the the, the, the original founders of this uh, this place were a pair of Italian entre entrepreneurial twins. They were genuine anthropologists. Uh, I tracked them down. One of them had recently passed away, but his, his twin brother was, uh, was still alive. And he told me about how they had a dream uh, one day in the early 1970s, uh, a, uh, a dream to establish a hotel on the Sudanese coast that would bring in tourists, uh, diving enthusiasts. In those days, the Italians were at the forefront of, of, uh, of diving expeditions, diving trips and uh, 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 holidays um, on, on, on ships going, uh, going to parts of the Mediterranean and so on that were used to these days, but it was a novelty back then. So they built this resort. It was on a peninsula, it was isolated. And what was extraordinary to find out was it was done in partnership with the Sudanese government. Uh, the president himself, Jaffa Nimeri, invested 50% into the, into the business. And the inauguration day, uh, by all accounts, was the most extraordinary affair. There were European princes, princesses there. Uh, Ira von Furstenberg, who was a socialite of the day, a princess. She, she was one of the special guests there. Uh, there was a, uh, a uh, what was known as a, 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 the makeup artist to the stars of the day, um, a, a person called uh, Gilles Camier, uh, uh, Roberto Merlo, who was like Jacques Cousteau, a famous uh, deep sea diver. And the guest of honor at the resort was none other than President Nimeri himself, the Sudanese president. And to celebrate this grand occasion, uh, they slaughtered an ox. Uh, in, in, in front of all the, uh, the, the, the guests gathered there because it was, it was uh, part of their tradition to do so. Uh, the resort originally functioned very successfully, but after five or six years, the two sides, the Italians and the Sudanese, they, uh, they fell, fell out with one another and the resort was abandoned. And it was at this point that, uh, well, two years on, that. Danny came across this, this uh, it's not quite right to call it derelict because it wasn't, but it was an abandoned resort, but, every, but it was structurally, it was, it was all there. And uh, the Mossad uh, invested something in the region of $100,000 to turn it round under the stewardship, by the way, of, uh, of a, a female agent uh, a, 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 a remarkable woman who I, who I know, still know very well and spoke to me at length about uh, what, she, what she did there. And Danny will attest how important this lady was to the success of the village and to the wider operation. 
Um, so, uh, Danny, I mean, this this this, this was your place. Uh, what you know? What was it like? What did the guests? What what was it like to be a guest there? And what was it like to be a serving Mossad agent there? It was uh, quite weird at the beginning, you know. We uh, we used to do all kinds of things, uh, but the thing I think this was one of the maybe the premier, you know. Anyway, I always once once I understood that this um, resort could become the cover of our activity and allow us to move freely and to move a lot of people and, and so on. Uh, I had to I had I had to build a, a team that was mainly um, uh, uh, members were uh, diving instructors. So um, I um, you know I, I recruited the people that were formerly Navy SEALs or or uh, civilian diving instructors, and all all of them had to speak uh, foreign languages and be able to sustain uh, interrogation. Uh, uh, undercover and so on and so on, and but I thought that a, the presence of a woman, of a, of a lady, would make things easier to swallow for the you know for the for the neighbors, for the Arabs, for the, the services, for the because they wouldn't suspect a woman to be part of something that is not um, kosher. And I had, the, I was very lucky. I was um, a friend that became also part of the team, a former SEAL, uh, introduced me to this uh, lady whose name is Yola. And, um, and uh, she, um, she agreed, you know, to, to, to participate in this. It's not easy. You can imagine what can, what can happen to a Jewish woman, Israeli, Woman, if, if she falls, uh, she's made prisoner or uh, arrested by this uh, a kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, regimes and uh, with the secret services and so on. And I had uh, trouble getting there, uh, getting her approved by my superiors, but uh, they were also impressed by her because she was very tough. Uh, she was very beautiful, but she was very tough. And she became actually the, um, she ran that uh, resort like very professionally. So not only we had the resort as, as, as a cover that allowed us to do what we needed to do, but she also actually uh, transformed this uh, formerly abandoned uh, resort into a move, into a very dynamic thing and we operated this uh, this resort uh, almost five years, which is uh, you know it's an eternity in terms of intelligence operations, because you have to be you have to sustain your cover every day. Every day it's, things can happen, and things happened. But she was very uh, cool, you know, and um, and even when there was some uh, surprise. Uh, inspections by the army and to, they wanted to know if maybe we are doing something else than, uh, than diving and she, you know, she, may, she managed to, to uh, pass through all these things and she, um, she was very respected and even feared by the employees and by some people in the, in the municipality of uh, Port Sudan, which was about uh, 50 miles uh, and you know all the shopping, shopping. You know, buying buying groceries in the market had to be done there because we were in a very isolated place and we ate the fish that we caught. But she was she sent or she went herself to buy the other things in in Port Sudan. So um, yeah, and she was like my logistics officer because we needed a lot of a lot of fuel to to cover those huge distances. Every operation meant going 750 miles to pick up the immigrants, the, 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 the Ethiopian Jews, and 750 miles back. And if, for example, if you wanted to send the mothership full of passengers, we had to do three journeys like this while the, the ship is waiting in the sea. 
sometimes a rough sea. So, you know, to do, uh, uh, you can make the mathematics, but in, in about a week, three times um, 1,500 miles, it's a lot of distance, and a lot of fuel, and there were no gas stations anywhere, only in Port Sudan, and we could not, uh, you know, go just fill up the, 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 the trucks. So she managed to find in, uh, all kind of uh, um, excuses why she needs so many, so much fuel because the generator is consuming too much. We had what we needed. And uh, yeah, the villa, actually, you know, in the third year of operation, uh, operating this uh, resort, we actually made more money than the lease that we were paying. We were paying $250,000 a year. This is something that is, uh, uh, there is a scene in the film where the guy who is in charge from the Ministry of Tourism and, and, and Chris Evans are discussing the, uh, how much money uh, would be paid. And he was uh, principally preoccupied by the by the, uh, you know, by the commission that he will get. In reality, it was not at all like this. Uh, I came to him, he never asked for any commission. He never asked for anything, any kind of gift or nothing. He just discussed with me the price. Now, I didn't know anything about how much should I offer. So I told him, you, you start, you tell me how much you want. I'm not sure he knew how much to ask because he was a former senior officer in the army. He was not a professional uh, hotel manager or something. And he, saw, he told me $500,000 a year. So I didn't know, you know, if it's good, if it's not good. But you know, it, that, those countries are expected to negotiate. Otherwise, they will consider you as an idiot. So he said 500, I said 200. And from then we started, you know, you see, it went down a little bit, I went up less. And finally we finished, we agreed on 250,000. And on the third year, we made more than 250,000. So I asked headquarters if, we, if I could, uh, you know, distribute some dividends to, to, to the team. It was a joke, of course, because uh, government money, you know, yeah. <laughs> But there were times also when we did not have enough guests to the headquarters and they would send the, all the alte kakers, if you understand the, the Arabic, <laughs> you know, some retirees, you know, yeah, guys that like, they look like me now, but at the time, and they would, uh, you know, they would uh, queue for the, uh, the big, uh, you know, uh, uh, thrill going to be guests, supposedly you know foreign guests in the in the resort. So yeah, there were there were humoristic scenes. Not only, not everything was you know. Uh, we 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 found ourselves, for example, because we developed a relationship with the chief of the navy. The, the chief of the Sudanese navy was our. More important, most important neighbor, and he was from the times of the Italians. He was he was used to get from the Italians every Thursday night huge fresh lobsters for his Shabbos dinner. You know they're Muslims, so the Shabbos dinner is on Thursday evening, not on Friday evening. So when when when, when I arrived there, he invited me to a conversation. And I, I even had a letter of introduction for him. That's another story. And we, we became, you know, we had a, a relationship. Uh, I promised him to supply the lobsters. And one, one, one time I was in a meeting with him and his deputy. And I was with one of my guys who is, uh, his cover was Italian. So we spoke Italian between us. And the, the, the deputy was formerly the, the commander of the, Sudanese Navy SEALs. They used to be a unit like that, but they had to, to shut it up because they didn't have enough budget to pay for the diving, for the equipment and blah, blah, blah. So my, uh, my, 
get the, the guy from my team tells me, you know, we should, we should um, uh, offer them to do, you know, introductory diving in our, in our resort. Uh, so, you know, to even to, to develop this relationship. So it happened. So there was a moment when former Israeli Navy SEALs were monitoring uh, diving with former Sudanese Navy SEALs, which is, you know, it's a quite a uh, humoristic situation for us, not for them. <laughs> Danny, we, uh, there's, there's so much wonderful ground to cover, but I keep my eye on time and uh, we, 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 we're going to have to uh, move to questions because I know people want to, uh, to ask uh, one or two things. So, uh, St Stephanie, could, could you uh, uh, moderate? Sure can. So our first question that we got was, how long did it take to put the team together and how many agents were on the resort? Well, it depended on times. When there was a, if there was a, an operation going on, we could be as much as a 10, 12. The team, the team had about 15 members, but there was a rotation. And there were times between operations when uh, Yola, the, the, the head of the resort, had uh, one or maybe two guys staying with her for the clients. It also depended on how many clients were at the given time, because if, let's say the, if the hotel was full, then we, are, we had more people there, not for the operation, but for, for the divings. And it, um, took, it took several months to, to put this team together. Oh, okay. Um, someone else asked, they said, we heard that a Jewish Canadian tourist went to the resort as a guest and noticed that they were cutting cucumbers and tomatoes and Israeli salad, just like the Israelis do, which is different than other countries or cultures. And he said, you're all Israelis, aren't you? Did this really happen? And if so, what did you do? Yeah, there was a, there was a, a guy who, not only the question of the salad, of the cutting, the cutting the salad very thin, but he, uh, he saw other things and he had, this guy would be many times in Israel and he was uh, dive, diving himself and he had spent time in Sudan, so he, he knew that things were happening in Sudan, okay? He understood something, so he thought that he had discovered, uh, and he had, but <laughs> he had discovered this uh, city. Oh, uh, I think with my team, for speaking, yeah. you know, born, born in an English speaking country. And he Danny, said, uh, Danny, you, 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 Danny, we lost out. your. Yeah. Danny, we lost. Sorry, we lost your connection for 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 uh, for a moment or two there. Can you just just recap about ten seconds behind where you were up okay. to? Okay. So you hear me now? Correct. Yeah. Loud and clear. Okay. So he he went for a private uh, diving with one of the instructors, who is a former officer in the Navy SEALs born in an English-speaking country, so, you know, you cannot suspect him to be an Israeli. And they, they had a long dive. And when they came out, you know, when you come after almost a, an hour under the water, you're a bit dizzy. So we asked him in Hebrew, how was it? Was it good? So the other guy, uh, you know, he forgot for a moment and he said, yes, in Hebrew, Ken. And then he realized what he had done. And then so he started saying, what did you say? I, didn't, uh, I don't know what. Anyway, he came back from the dive, came to where I was and told me the story. And he said, look, I think I'm burned. So maybe I should leave. So I told him, oh, let's see. Well, you know, I went to the room of this guy, knocked at the door and say, I introduced myself as the manager of the company that operates the resort. And I, I wanted to know if everything was okay, if his diving uh, had been good, uh, you know, uh, tell me how you feel. He said, uh, everything is okay, everything is okay. And I had seen that he uh, booked for a night dive. Night dive is more expensive, 
And it's a beautiful thing to do. So I, you know, I led him into the, uh, to the shore and I told him, you see that place there in the sea? This is where you're going to dive tonight. And I'll tell you something about this place. It's a very special place. There is a, um, a, a kind of sharks that love kosher meat. So, you know, the guy uh, went uh, completely white. He was already white, but he was whiter. And he said, no, no, but you know, no, I, I don't know nothing. I didn't see nothing. I, don't, uh. I said, of course you didn't see nothing. And you won't see, uh, I'm not going to say anything. I said, of course you're not going to say anything. He said, no, 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 uh, please, I'm, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm with you, I'm for you, I'm Jewish, I'm this, I'm that. So I told him, look, you can, maybe you can leave, but you know that we can find you anywhere. So he, uh, you know, he, uh, he, uh, he, he said that he was not going to the, this night dive and he left uh, very early in the morning and that's it. And you can um, find the story in the book. <laughs> you can find the story in the book. Yeah. <laughs> um, we had someone else ask that they were sure that you probably used a different accent when you were in Sudan. Can you give us an example of how you sounded? In which language? Because I spoke uh, Arabic with the Arabs, French with the French, and this kind of English with those who speak uh, spoke English. He says English. I, I don't have uh, an Israeli accent anyway. So, uh, okay, the next question. Uh, the next question was, yeah. um, was every staff member an agent? And what about local employees? Were there any people from the village that worked there? Well, first of all, of course, the, team, the operational team were all uh, agents, but they were not uh, what you call employees of the Mossad. They were on a, on a special contract and they were specifically trained and for this operation and when they finished the, the time of the contract, they went back to civilians. And a few, like my deputy and uh, maybe one more, were uh, actual Mossad employees. The local staff, at least there was one guy who was working for the opposition. That we, we discovered that he was working for the Sudanese Secret Service. And he was there to see, um, to report if we, um, if we do something that was not, uh, you know, uh, included in the idea of running a resort. How many Ethiopian Jews were rescued during your operation? Well, you know, it's not a question of my, because I was all, the, after that, my, my deputy replaced me and the operation continued. Uh, there was one year uh, stopped in 1985 after Operation Moses, because there had been a coup, a military coup in Sudan itself. And then it continued several years. So in total, I would say around the 1700, 1800 uh, Jewish uh, Ethiopian Jews passed through the Sudan in order to make Aliyah to Israel. And what has to be said is that in this, this long journey through Ethiopia to the Sudanese border, into Sudan, in the camps, was uh, cost a lot of lives, and uh, there is a monument in uh, in the uh, Herzl Mount in Jerusalem, where the big uh, uh, military uh, cemetery is, um, where there are there are fifteen hundred and sixty names are engraved in the in, in, this, in the monument for the fallen of the uh, Ethiopian uh, Jews in their on their way to Israel. Um, we had another question, Rafi or Danny could answer this. When did the reality of the operation come to surface? Like when did the story come out? Was it ever discovered? In 1985, uh, when there was this coup d'etat, the headquarters decided to abandon the, the, the resort and to withdraw the team back to Israel. So this is when you know, next morning the clients woke up 
and the staff, they woke up and all the, all the Europeans had gone. By the way, one of the things which uh, I uncovered was that there was a latter-day guest at the resort about five years after the, uh, the resort uh, shut uh, and, and under uh, Danny's team and, subs and uh, the subsequent commander of the operation after the Mossad uh, left the resort, it was, it was abandoned, it was taken over by the uh, Sudanese authorities and then in about uh, 1991, none other than um, Osama bin Laden moved in. And, uh, you know, just think about it, here is uh, Israel's, perhaps Israel's most mortal enemy, sleeping in the beds that the Mossad agents themselves had, uh, had slept in and using the resort that was, uh, that was um, uh, turned around and, uh, and, and brought up to standard by, uh, by the Mossad and, uh, and the Mossad's money. It's quite extraordinary. Now, Rafi, do you have any new books in the works or do you have any future projects coming up? I'm researching for a book at the moment, which is, uh, again, it's an astonishing story, a completely different subject matter. It's a true story uh, to do with a family who survived the, uh, the Holocaust uh, in, uh, in Slovakia. And uh, one of the members of this family, who was a teenage girl at the time, managed to give the Gestapo the, the slip. And uh, as she hid from place to place, one of the things that she did was taunt them with, uh, with postcards. And she would send letters to the Gestapo saying, I'm having a lovely time, come and catch me. So I'm piecing it together. Uh, and that's, that's what uh, I'm working on at the moment. Wonderful. Um, before this had all started, we were all kind of chatting and you said you had a really short kind of time period to put Red Sea Spies together. Um, how long did you research it and did it, you know, were you working on it, writing, you know, and then writing it to get it to publication? So the entire, uh, the entire kind of research and writing uh, of it probably under a year. Um, in fact, the writing of it was, was much shorter than that. Really, it was, um, it was about five months to put pen to paper. But I mean, that was a very, very intensive process. And I was working you know, 10, 11 hours a day nonstop. But uh, again, as I, as, I, as I shared with you before we kind of came, on, came online, it was a, a process which I absolutely loved. It was a, a labor of love and a very good reason because it's such a spectacular story. You know, I, I do question why the makers of the film had to embroider the, the events because it's, uh, it's not necessary. The actual, the actual events which took place are eminently more spectacular than, you know, than, than, than is shown in the Hollywood movie. Well, you'll have to let us know when that new one comes out so we can let everybody know the title and where they can get it. Um, speaking of which, Red Sea Spies, you can get it um, through Barnes & Noble. I put the link in the chat box um, so you can order that via Barnes & Noble. And we also have um, signed book plates from Rafi. He sent some all the way from London for us. So if you purchase the book and you want to get a signed book plate, just email me at registration at jewishtoledo.org. And again, thank you, the Toledo Federation and Foundation for uh, helping us host this event this evening. Thank you, Jan, Danny, who um, stayed in tonight to hang out with us at 1 a.m. Uh, Israeli time, so, and all the way from London. So like we said, this is an international book festival. So we've been able to bring people in from all over the world. So it's been very exciting. So thank you, Danny. Thank you, Rafi, for writing an amazing true story thriller and, um, and for being with us tonight. Thank you very much. Pleasure, Bye. thank you. Good night, everyone. Be safe. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.
Good night, everybody. Wear your masks, behave. We've got two more events tomorrow. Everybody knows where to find me. Registration at JewishToledo.org. Thank you, everyone. Andy, quit laughing. <laughs>